This week on Oasis by the Sea, Pastor Keith teaches, Make the Path Straight, from John 1, 19 through 34. The first thought of the morning is simply this. What's the essential details of Jesus? If you were to say, someone were to say, well, tell me that I've never heard of Jesus. What? Please tell me. What would you have to include? What would be the essential? And, and I don't know if there's a right answer to that question. I'm not judging you. Um, but one way that we could answer that question would be to look at the four accounts of the life of Jesus that we have written. We call them the four Gospels. And it's actually interesting how little of the four Gospels that, that are all the same event. In other words, that, that only a few events comparatively are captured in all four accounts. In other words, what made it into all four? What made the cut? If we did a study on that, I think the results would surprise you. Most of the events that make it into all four Gospels happen towards the end of Jesus' life. Uh, the final trip to Jerusalem, the Passover, which introduces the Lord's Supper, the death and resurrection of Jesus, and all that obviously makes the list. And there's a few more things scattered throughout the Gospels that made it into all four. The first event, though, that shows up isn't the virgin birth. That's not in all four. It's only in two. The first one that's in all four is the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist. I thought this week about how much more familiar we are with the record of Jesus' birth, despite the fact that many of those details only show up in one gospel. For instance, wise men from the east, we all know that. That's only in the gospel of Matthew. Uh, angels appearing to shepherds, we all know that, only shows up in Luke. And I love Christmas, I do. But if those details were essential, then all four authors would have made sure they were included. Even the virgin birth is only included, like I said, in half of the accounts. And so we have this event every year called Christmas, and because of that event, we are really familiar with that. And yet, the gospel writers didn't even, half of them didn't even think that's where they needed to start. The most important first event of the life of Jesus isn't his birth and the things that go around that. It's as miraculous and fantastic as that was, and it was. It's his baptism. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. We're continuing in the gospel of John. We just started last week. We just did the opening stanza, the prophetic vision that John has about the beginning of the world and Christ's involvement with that and how clear John is making it that Jesus is not just a godly man. He's not just a man sent by God. He's a man who is God. He has made that absolutely positively clear in his op opening statements. And now from that he goes to the baptism of Jesus. Now here's a few background points before we get going. Maybe you don't know, but John the Baptist was Jesus's older cousin. Jesus is going to say kind of an odd thing in the middle of this concerning the fact that his cousin was older than he was. John had a very powerful ministry before Jesus. There is no biblical indication at all that Jesus had any kind of ministry at all during his 20s. He started in his 30s. John, however, had been having a ministry for a bit. John the Baptist, like Jesus, lived in the region of Galilee. Uh, and if you don't know anything about uh, New Testament geography, there was a region called Judea, which would have been what we would call the country of the Jewish people, even though Rome had taken over everything. That's still their territory. And then there was an area above that called Samaria. And then above that was this little region called Galilee. It wasn't owned by the Jewish people, but a bunch of Jewish people lived there. That's where Jesus started his ministry. He didn't start it in the country of the Jewish people. He started it in the settlement to the north called Galilee. And that is also where his cousin started his ministry. John was baptizing people and then dunking them in the water. Why? We know from Mark 1.5 that people were traveling from Judea, the capital in Jerusalem. People were traveling in droves to go see this guy way up in Jerusalem. So they're taking this trip around Samaria to go see him. It was about a day's walk there and a day's walk back. It was a pretty serious commitment. People were traveling a long way to do this. It was clearly a religious activity. 
But it didn't fall into any of the traditional purposes. Jewish people did, and by the way, still do, practice ritual immersion that has some similarity to what we would call baptism. Here's some reasons that you'd be ritually immersed in water in Judea. Uh, women after childbirth and men uh, menstruation. Uh, men before Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, and the three pilgrimage festivals. Uh, there's something called the Temple Mount. Before you ascend that, you would be ritually immersed and cleansed. And conversion into Judaism. So we did not make up the whole get dunked to join the church thing. Jews have been doing it for way longer than us. You had to get immersed to become a Jew. They needed to be performed uh, in a religious setting by a priest. And priests in the Jewish community were called Levites because they were all from the same family of Levi. And John the Baptist is, by the way, a Levite. His father was a priest named Zacharias. In that particular sense, he was of the priestly line. He could claim the right to do this sort of thing. And yet what he was doing wasn't in the right place, and it wasn't for any of the right reasons. And so, by the way, let's go to a picture. This is where he's doing it at the Jordan. To the right is what we call the Sea of Galilee. Today we would call it a lake because it's inland. At the time it was called the Sea of Galilee. So when you hear the word Sea of Galilee, especially as we go through the book of John, it's not, it's not like you know, the Mediterranean. This is an inland lake. Uh, this is the Jordan as it comes in. It's nice and green, and the Jordan keeps going. I doubt that he was doing it in this particular place. In fact, we know from this passage that it was a place called Bethany. This is the scene. If you can imagine, John was kind of a wild guy. He didn't dress very well. He didn't bathe a lot. He ate weird things, and he's out there saying this stuff about repenting people. And people are coming in droves to a place like this to come get wet in this river. So the religious leaders at the temple are going to send an investigating team to go check this guy out and see if they can just let this go, whether this is harmless or whether they need to squish it. So that's what's happening as we start this passage and what's going on in the background. So we're going to start with John 1, 19 and 20. And this is the witness of John when the Jews sent him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, and he confessed, I am not the Christ. By the way, I didn't make that rep repetition out of a mistake. That's actually the way it reads. He says it twice. I'm not the Christ. Why would he even say that? Well, see, ever since Rome took over the whole region, the Jews have been desperately looking for this guy, a, a Messiah, a savior, a victor, a military leader who would save them from Rome and kick all the Romans out. And several people already have stepped up to claim they were, they were that guy and then got killed. Oh, I guess you're not the guy. Oh, there's somebody that's going to be the guy. Oh, that ended badly. This has happened a couple times. And, and they're wondering, okay, are you another person claiming to be the guy? Are you gathering followers because you're going to be the guy? And if so, go for it. Go kick out the Romans. Yay, team. But, it, you know, what are you claiming? And his first statement is, nope, that's not me. I am not claiming to be the guy. I'm not claiming to be the Messiah. Now, they're going to keep questioning him. But before I go any further, I find it interesting the things that John the Baptist doesn't know. There are a couple things in this whole exchange that do John doesn't know that I would have expected John to know, but he doesn't know. I find this really interesting. So kind of look for this as we go. We're going to go to verse 21. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. And they said, are you the prophet? And he said, no. Now, Elijah and the prophet, you'd have to be an Old Testament scholar, but the, old, you know, the, the Jews of the time had decided that there had to be two individuals that would show up before the Messiah. One was going to be called Elijah, the one was going to be called the prophet, the prophets from the book of Deuteronomy. I think they got that wrong anyway, but that's another discussion. But they're like, are, if you're not the guy, are you the guy that comes before the guy? That's the question. They're trying to figure this out. Who are you? John says he's neither, which is weird because 
Jesus says in Matthew eleven fourteen that John the Baptist is the Elijah who was to come. So how do we work this out? If Jesus is telling the truth and John is telling the truth, then what do we do? There's really only one explanation. John didn't know. That's, that's how you can tell the truth and be wrong at the same time, right? You, you can do this. You can tell the truth as well as you know it and be wrong. That's not dishonest. It's just misinformed. Whatever it meant to be the Elijah, John did not know. But it's important to remember that John was just a person, like you and me. I mean, perhaps the sin of pride would have been too much for John. So God simply chose not to reveal that particular thing to him. I don't know. I don't know John. I don't know what John struggled with. I don't know what his personal foilables were. John was a guy who was capable of sinning and, and having trouble and making mistakes. He was a dude. What I do know is that who Jesus saw John to be and who John saw himself to be were not exactly the same. And I think that's an important truth. I think there's an important truth buried in the fact that when Jesus looks at us, he sees stuff we would never see in ourselves. That Jesus proclaims things about us that we would never... No, that's, no, that's not me. I wonder what Jesus sees in us. I wonder what destiny some might have, that if they knew that destiny, it would ruin everything. So God knows, but we don't know. Because we just need to march towards that destiny in obedience. We just need to walk toward it, and then when we get there, we'll handle it, because God will be there. But if we knew in advance, we'd, we'd mess it up. So we don't know. I wonder if in eternity we'll be shocked at how important God considered some of our obedience when we thought much less of it. Some small thing that we did and we didn't think it was a big deal. God said, talk to that person, encourage that person, share this little thing. We did it and we walked away and we had no concept of the impact that that had on them. And we're going to find out much later, oh, thank you, Lord, for making me obedient in that moment. I had no idea how important that would be to them. So the delegation still has no answer to take back to the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem yet. So they're still going. Let's look at John 22 and 23. They said to him, Who are you so that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. If you were here last week, like I said, we talked at length about how the author, John the, the disciple, wants to make it so clear who Jesus is. I want you to look at that Lord in capitals, capital L, capital O, capital R. That, that is the Y-H, the J, yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yahweh or Yehovah or whichever way you like to pronounce it, people disagree about the correct pronunciation, is the name of God. Who are you, John? My job is to make straight the way of God, not the Messiah, not a person. Now we know what John is setting up to do. John is setting up to make up the way for Jesus. So they're asking about this, who are you? Who are you making the way for? Who are you? What are you doing? And John says, I'm making it for God. It is a proclamation of the deity of Christ. I am making the way for God himself to come. That's who I am. That's actually a step up from just being there before the Messiah. The people understood Messiah to be a person. John is saying, no, I'm not making the way for a person. I am making the way for God. That is a different statement. That is a different role. I doubt anyone had ever, up to that point in Jewish history, ever claimed to be that person. I don't know that for sure, but I have a feeling that the people who came to do that went, what? <laughs> You're proclaiming what? Nobody does that. Nobody claims to be that person. What do we do with that? I don't know. I'm whispering. John then tells them about the main event. I'm, I don't have this in slides. I'm just going to read this. You can read it yourself with me if you want. It's from John 1, 24 through 27, or you can just listen. 
Now they had been sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him and said to him, Why then are you baptizing, if you're not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And John answered them, saying, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. The tragedy of this little delegation that's sent to question John is that their mission, their goal, is to find out whether John is worthy to do something. When standing among them in the crowd is the Messiah they've been waiting for. And they're not interested in that. They don't want to find Jesus. They don't want to see this. They're not interested. All they want to do is judge the messenger. That's what they're there to do. They're there to judge the messenger, and when they're done, they leave. And we're going to find out if they had just stayed one more day, they would have been able to see Jesus, the Messiah they'd been waiting for, the great hero. He was right there. They just needed one more day, but they're like, okay, we got our, we've, we're finished judging you now. Uh, we're going to go tell other people how we've judged you. Goodbye. And they leave. And then we go to the next day. This is starting in verse 29 to 30. Then the next day he saw Jesus coming to him. And he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. I pointed out last week that existed before me bit. <laughs> Remember John's older? And he says, Jesus existed before me. It's a claim to Jesus' eternal nature. Jesus has always existed. He always will exist. He existed before me, my younger cousin. This statement is massively important. It's easy in hindsight to see that this statement matches the identity of Jesus perfectly. It's easy as Christians now because we know the whole story. Go, oh yeah, Jesus, Lamb of God, check. And we forget this is at the very beginning, nothing has happened yet. The mission, the mission has not started. The, the ministry hasn't progressed. Jesus hasn't preached anything. This is how it all starts. It all starts with, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God is a reference to Passover. Jesus will die during Passover. And Jesus will die as the ultimate Lamb of God. But the baptizer changes the scope. You see, the, the Jewish people had a practice by which a lamb was slain for, for sin for their people. But John just pushes it way up there. He goes, no, 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 not, not your people. The planet, everyone, the world, all people of all nations, everywhere. That you're way too small. Here comes the one that does it for everybody. This is a huge step up. The statement firmly brackets the entire ministry of Jesus. It connects the beginning to the end. And the baptism itself also connects to the end. Remember that the baptism of John is for repentance. All right? Consider this. If the baptism John is doing is for repentance, what is Jesus doing there? He has nothing to repent of. Why is he in line? Imagine the line of people waiting for their moment in the water, each with their own shame that they're eager to be free of. In front of Jesus might be an adulterer. Behind him might be a thief. To be in that line was to admit your guilt to everybody watching. To be in that line was to say, there is a need for me to go in that water and be cleansed because I am guilty. Yet Jesus is standing there with no guilt. The perfect Son of God stands with them, bearing the same stares, the same whispers, people wondering what he had done, that he felt so much guilt that he needed to be cleansed in the Jordan. Jesus starts his ministry by identifying with the broken, the dirty, the violent, and the unfaithful, and he will end his ministry the same way. It is his purpose. It is a purpose of Jesus to identify with sinners, though he does not deserve it. 
It starts that way. It finishes that way. It is why he came here. He came here to identify with people to take something from us he did not deserve to have to take. And so he starts it standing in our place. Jesus begins his ministry by standing in our place. He saves us by dying in our place so we can live forever in his place. Now remember how John the Baptist didn't know that he was the Elijah who was to come. Check out what else he didn't know. Twice he says this. So let's look through uh, verses 31 through 34. And I did not recognize him. But in order that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water, and John bore witness, saying, I have beheld the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained on him, and I did not recognize him. But he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. I'd mentioned before that John the Baptist and Jesus were blood relatives. When he says, I did not recognize him, he doesn't mean I don't know who this guy is. He doesn't mean I don't know his name was Jesus. I didn't know his mom and dad were Mary and Joseph. He doesn't mean that. He means twice. I grew up with this guy. I lived around him. I saw him at weddings and funerals and other family gatherings. I knew him, yet I did not realize who he was until the Holy Spirit descended upon him. I didn't know. <laughs> I grew up with him and I didn't know. But I know now. There's a portion of the process of understanding who Jesus is that only God can do. This part of this journey of recognizing Jesus for who he really is that God has to do. We see it over and over with the the people that were with Jesus, Thomas doubted till he put his hands in the holes. His, his disciples made all kinds of crazy requests and statements that proved over and over that they didn't really get it. Even John the Baptist later, after all this, after proclaiming Jesus as the Son of God, when he's in prison of Herod, waiting to die, he sends his disciples and so, are you sure? You know why? Because he's a human being and prison sucks. And the pressure of being, having, you know, I'm going to die because this guy's going to cut my head. That, that isn't confidence boosting. He struggled. He wrestled. It was hard. And he'd seen it. And he was a man of God. And he had proclaimed him from the beginning. He was the one who made the path straight. And yet when the life, when life went <coughs> and held him, it was hard. And he had to ask again, are you sure? Because that's what it means to be human. We struggle. We doubt. We wrestle. We must come back. And God must reveal to us again, no, this is the truth. This is my son. There are three people in this event. And we need to understand which of these three people we need to be. The first person is Jesus, the Lamb of God who stands in the place of sinners who existed before his older cousin and who takes away the sin of the world. A man that the baptizer had known his whole life and yet until this moment, he doesn't even realize who he really is. The Lamb of God, the sacrifice required to save people from death who takes away the sin of the world. I, I just, you don't get to be this person. You don't get to save yourself. You don't get to save anyone else either. The world is full of people who believe they can, who believe that they can save themselves if they just do enough good things, if they rescue enough things, if they chalk up enough points that they can save themselves. I'm just telling you, nobody gets to be Jesus except Jesus. That's it. There's a second person in the story. That's the challenger's. The challengers who question our right to proclaim the Messiah, who want answers but can't be bothered to wait for the revelation of truth. The Levites and the scribes, who are you to do such things? Who do you think you are? 
They weren't there to repent. You see, other people were coming to John to repent. They, they weren't coming to repent. They didn't think there was anything they needed to repent of. They never would have considered themselves as people who needed repentance. They wouldn't have stand, stood in that line and identified with sinners. Not in a million years. Jesus did, but not them. If they'd only stuck around. They could have seen him, but they left. They got their answer and they left. And at the end of the day, they didn't want Jesus and all that he represented. They just wanted to know who John thought he was to stir up all this fuss. <coughs> I hope none of us are this person. I know these people. The scoffers, the mockers, the one who deny. Who do you Christians think you are? They're defensive before I even open up my mouth. Oh, you're a pastor. I suppose you're going to tell me how to live now, what to do. And it's sad. You know, there's people who come to church, though, even. They're even in the church. They're church people. They walk into the door, and somehow, somewhere in their mind, the truth of the matter is that they're more interested by walking into that room than judging the persons talking at the podium than they are in seeing Jesus that day. And we can get caught in that trap ourselves. We can get caught in some sort of trap where, where we're there to judge. We're not there to be exposed to Christ. <laughs> we're not there to be exposed to the wonder of who Jesus is. We're there to decide whether this person at the front is worthy of our attention. And we spend the entire sermon deciding whether or not that was true or that was false or how much I liked it or who else this might apply to. We don't want to be the ones who have come to judge rather than to experience who Christ is. Let's avoid that identity. Let's be person number three, the baptizer who calls people to repent, who's just trying to obey the old Holy Spirit, who recognizes the Son of God. The baptizer isn't rich. He's not trying to amass power. He doesn't even see himself as anyone that important, but he's bold and he takes risks and he speaks truth. This morning at about one o'clock in the morning, I got the phone call that my mom died. My Mom was this guy. You know, she, uh, she heard the call of Christ and she said yes. And she had no idea what yes would mean when she said yes. And it started with doing Vacation Bible School in America, we call it Vacation Bible School. It's like church camp for a church. It's just a little thing that you do during the summertime. Hundreds of kids. Where she got to proclaim that, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then she ended up in Africa at a missionary school teaching missionary kids. And, and then they ended up in the Philippines, my dad and my mom. And they did that until she couldn't do it anymore just couldn't do it anymore. So they went home and, and she taught and she, she mentored and she worked in the church for as long as she could. And when she couldn't do that anymore, she prayed. She prayed for this church every day. She prayed for some of you every day. Some of you that have never met her, but I talked about who you were and what was going on in your life and she prayed for you until she could not pray anymore. God isn't asking us, ask us to be perfect or even fully functional. He's asking us to follow him, to recognize who he is, and then just go out there and tell everybody that we can, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We can do it. You can do it. We're not Jesus. We can't save anybody. Let's not be so judgmental that we're busy deciding what's good enough instead of just experiencing Jesus. Let's be the one who recognizes who Jesus is and just tells as many people as we possibly can. Let's pray. You've been listening to Oasis by the Sea. Thank you for joining us. May God richly bless you as you walk in obedience to Him this week. See you next week at the Oasis.